Hello everybody and welcome back to another review. I'm of course Captain Sedaris and after a long break, Seven Saturn joins me again. Hi there. Hi guys. Welcome back. It's, yeah, like I said, a long time. Happy to have you back. Yeah, good to be here. And also good to have nice guests. Yeah, as always, we have an expert in our group to really talk about the game. For that reason, I invited Wildheart, a longtime fan and mother of Homeworld Remastered. Hi there. Hello, thanks for having me. Good to have you because you are a longtime player, like I said, and I wanted to know how did you get into the game? Ooh, how can I answer this question without me coming across as too old? Well, basically, the, like how I got into the franchise, should we start there for a little bit of a personal story, if that's okay? Or... Yeah, I would like to hear it. Okay, well, Homeworld fans always have these funny moments or experiences of how they got into the franchise. For me, it's simple. I was in a bookstore in a city in my country at a very young age, and I uh, saw a certain PC game on a shelf that caught my interest. It was called Homeworld, and uh, well, back when we got home, I started it up, and for some reason, I found myself roped into the franchise, and here we are. So you basically got it from the local library? Or oh, a local media outlet store. It's, it's really funny how such big events that can shape your life can actually be chance encounters. It's rare. Yeah, it's it's actually kind of sad that we kind of have lost that over time. Most games are usually now published on Steam or somewhere. You are not going to any shop or something and buy that. Or usually you're not, you don't. So. I, I kind of missed this. There was a time where uh, we could indeed do that. But I think that's that's also why platforms like GOG thrive. Because there's still demand for the old games and the pleasures that come with them. Like having to actually browse through a manual and homewards. We can yeah. definitely also talk about that. I'm not sure if you've heard the stories about the game's manual. Oh, I have it still behind me. I love the manual. Okay, well then you know it's quite big, to say the least. <laughs> oh yes, I love big manuals. I always call it the toilet factor in gaming. If I can take the game basically to the toilet and read there and immerse myself into the game, I love the game even more. Homeworld is definitely a franchise where you don't need to actually play the game to experience it, if that's the way to put it. It's more expanded than just gaming, yeah, totally. But I would say, let's answer the question of the day. What is Homeworld? Um, I guess the official introduction is that it's a 3D space RTS game that heavily thrives on lore and world building and, of course, space battles with awesome looking spaceships and backdrops. That's the most simple way I can put it. But if you ask anyone in the community itself, they would say Homeworld is a way of life. It's a person project let's get handed down between generations but yeah for most players i would just uh, start by saying it's a 3d space rts that and i think it's a perfect introduction to outer space that it isn't limited to two dimensions you can finally attack the enemy from every angle it doesn't matter from the side below above everything is possible and in addition to that, you also, of course, have the, the Battlestar Galactica feeling in all three games, especially the first one in which you experience how the planet, how your planet is destroyed and you have to find the mystical homeworld Higara. Oh, that's the thing about homeworld, right? Like the concept is very simple. Go home to the promised land. But the execution of the first game is they just nailed it so well that they were able to build an entire franchise upon just that simple concept done so, right? Yeah, and the interesting part about it is th they didn't want to create really the, the best RTS game in the world. They just wanted to create an epic space battle for the fans out there, basically. I always think that you can't really force yourself to create great games. They just happen by accidents. Like you can copy certain well-received parts or basically just replicate the formula but the biggest successes in the industry are not always the titles that were intended to be the biggest successes sometimes it's just small games that just hits the right short and became big like homeworld i think for the most part it's when, when 
people are kind of passionate about what they are doing or if an idea actually is new and well executed and works. I think there are many games out there that, as you say, use a formula and the problem is, yeah, this game that they copied it from was successful, so the formula works somehow, but um, it's not enough. Just a working concept is not enough. You have to put in something special, special love or a special idea or something. Yeah, I think this is what makes this game specifically special. Everything in life is imitation, but it's about how you do it. Yeah. Since you already jumped basically in the history part. Uh oh. No, uh, totally fine. I would say we continue there. The game basically started from a very small developer studio. Just a few young guys in their 20s said, hey, we want to make a space game. In the beginning, they called it Spaghetti Bowl, which is a reference to all the, the fighters and the iron trails. If, the, if you zoom out, you see basically a spaghetti pole flying around. Luckily, they changed the title to Homeworld, which sold, I think, a little bit better. There was probably some marketing reasons for that, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, like I said, they didn't want to create the best RTS game. They just wanted to have epic space battles. The only real goal for them was to have a fully 3D environment. To, to create this special version of space battles in gaming. They always wanted to achieve that in other games, but yeah, it wasn't possible. And sadly, it's still not <laughs> in many games. Pretty much like there's no real shortage of space RTSs. But if you look at everything that is on offer, you see a common, or well, I wouldn't call it an issue, but at the same time, it's kind of is a common limitation that it's all space, but it's a 3D setting, but on a 2D plane. You see it in a lot of titles like Sins of a Solar Empire, uh, other titles that are famous and known, but it seems simple on paper, but to actually create 3D space and have it play like a 3D space game, that's something not many titles have done right. Yeah, and also it's really hard to imagine a game concept for, yeah, for casual gamers. To, to basically recreate in a 3D environment is really difficult. We don't see it for that reason also that often. Yeah, and I'd say for me as a noob, this is basically where I struggled as well with. I mean, <laughs> we are bipeds, you know, you, you, we are walking around and doing things, things in 3D. Uh, we can do that, but uh, actually our minds are not very, very good at that f for starters usually. And I mean, that there's a reason why you need to have actual training for piloting you know and i mean a lot of training and getting things done in 3d and having a game um, make you do stuff in 3d and doing it properly um, is kind of a challenge and they also i think got this done mostly well but it shows that it is a, a complicated task but one amazing thing is they managed to convince sarah entertainment to publish this game with only two whiteboard presentations and no demo so just talking about it and yeah they managed it to get something cooked yeah today you would probably have to have some sort of prototype or something to show them yeah we can actually pull this off and luckily i would say they got sarah entertainment because they were back then known that they are not that strict with release dates the original goal was to release in 1998 but after some feedback, they decided, ah, we definitely need more polishing, which then leads to a release in 1999. And yeah, it worked basically. In just half a year, they sold 500,000 copies. And similar like in Ground Control, Sarah said, we need an expansion now. Give us that immediately. For that, they hired another small studio called Barking Dog. They managed to create a standalone homeworld expansion called Cataclysm, which was again released in a very short time, just under a year. I think Cataclysm is a kind of interesting story in that regards. Like, as many of you probably know, it was originally planned to be just an expansion or an add-on to homeworld. But the concept was done so well and they saw so much potential in it that it became its own game. And even now, when we have Homeworld 3, 
there's still many people who actually prefer Cataclysm over Homeworld 3. When we talk about it being standalone, um, I suppose it's still basically based on the same game, but kind of an elaborate mod, or did they write this from scratch or something? It's really similar to the ground control expansion. It totally runs on their own, same engine, different studio. Okay. So it's so funny that Sarah again did this. <laughs> it's so similar. And what, what I'm wondering about is when, when I hear, okay, the other guys did that, was the original team already occupied with Homeworld 2 or something? Or why didn't they give the job to the guys who pulled it off the first time? I read basically they started soon working on the concept of Homeworld 2, but it wasn't really in development, so I don't know exactly the reason why Homeworld 2 was really the next game from Relic Entertainment and Barking Dog Studio did the expansion, but maybe you, Whiteheart, you know a little bit about that? <laughs> well, not much more than you do, because as myself, I was also kind of a late arrival to the Homeworld community. When I got into the game, Homeworld 1 was already out, Cataclysm was already out, and Homeworld 2 was actually closer to being released. It would release a few, a few years after I got into the franchise. But I think you pretty much got the gist of it. Relic uh, was doing bus was busy with other projects, and they uh, maybe outsourced this right term to Barking Dog, but they did a phenomenal job with it, I'll say. What we should also mention about Homeworld Cataclysm is that they had to rename the game in 2017 for the re-release on GOG to Homeworld Emergence. Uh, as the name Cataclysm was trademarked by Blizzard Entertainment for the third expansion in VOV. Are you sure this voice chat won't be in problems because you used the word Cataclysm here? It's because it's trademarked? Oh no, that's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's the same way you think about it. A company wants to trademark the word Cataclysm and Homeworld, which was also named that, but because of it, it has to actually adjust and re-release under a different name, Emergence. But yeah, trademarking words, imagine. Yeah. yeah. You have a lot of spare time on your hands if you want to go this route. It is, this is really something that also messes me up. Uh, it's pretty much the same as having a trademark on a color. It's the same kind of bullshit basically you know I mean you can understand that you try to distinguish yourself from the other guys but it gets specifically funny if the title of the other guys has been around even longer so it's basically you that are cop copycatting it and you are the one who cla is claiming okay no, no one has to name their stuff like ours what the fuck well, there's actually a small little trick you can do with uh, Emergence, as it's called now. If you actually delete some files, then you will just see Cataclysm again when you boot up the game. So it's really only superficial. And it's really strange if you consider they already have, before the word Cataclysm, Homeworld. Where's the problem, really, Blizzard? Exactly. Blizzard is the problem. Yeah, yeah. That could be. <laughs> They're not exactly uh, well received in the gaming industry these days. Yeah, sadly. They did a great job in the past, but nowadays they are really strange. I mean, usually it shows if you have to resort to this kind of moves. I find it specifically funny because those are the guys that actually were worrying um, about one of their factions, you know, in StarCraft, the Zerg. Because there's also a Disney character written a little bit differently, but spoken is pronounced the very same way, Zerg. And they pulled it off, they got away with that, and no one bat an eye, and uh, then they do it the other way around. Why? Uh, are you that desperate? Are you really that worried? What's going on, guys? Moving on to Homeworld 2. Yeah, sadly, there isn't much documentation about the development besides of the release date in 2003. I only know that it was done in a Lua programming language and that the development wasn't that easy. They had to restart development almost from scratch after the first design proved to be too ambitious, basically. And same goes for Homeworld 3 days and that much documentation, but maybe you know a little bit more. About Homeworld 2 developments, you said? 2 or 3. 
Well, we can probably they're kind of interlinked because Homeworld 3 is what the developers wanted to do with Homeworld 2 originally. But yeah, dating back, there is a Homeworld concept that you may have heard of, Dust Wars. Um, they say that that's and basically the whole mecha structure thing that that was what they originally wanted to do with Homeworld 2. But the technology at the time, and Blackbird also said this in recent times in an interview, the technology wasn't there at the time in the early 2000s. So the game that they wanted to make, or just they envisioned it, had to be scrapped, and it became kind of a last minute rush job. And that's how we got Homeworld 2, with some more heavy leaning onto the mysticism parts that made the original great. But Homeworld 2 really dragged that aspect to the forefront. So we now have ancient ones, prophecies, mystical devices, and it feels more like a religious concept. But the reason why it may feel a bit hollow to people is because Homeworld 2 didn't have the development they envisioned for it. But with Homeworld 3, that game is 20 years later. Um, well, that's actually kind of interesting because you would say, well, they did have plenty of time and they had a lot of feedback to draw from, from Homeworld 2 and Homeworld Remastered. But uh, apparently uh, something went not as planned, to say the least, and now we have Homeworld 3. And all its... Uh, Shall we say, uh, mm. I wonder what a good word for this is. Before we go maybe into pros and cons of all the different games, I just want to mention uh, a few special nuggets I found. I found it, for example, very interesting that they scrapped a few ideas which I would have loved. For the first homeworld, they wanted to include ships customization. This is a rare concept in RTS games and it would have fitted so perfectly to the game. I find it so sad that they scrapped that. Well, it's true and you can still find some evidence of it in Homeworld 2 and later titles. I think also that the subsystems that's big in Homeworld 2 was actually kind of a nudge in that direction. The ability to customize your ships. It's but just, I'm just thinking about it, but Homeworld 3, you know, Homeworld 3, all ships look kind of uniform, really, but Homeworld 2, yeah, they actually made it pretty big. Subsystems, fleet colors, all those things happened there first. Another interesting thing is that they envisioned five different races for the first game, which is such an overkill, but it would be nice to have in the entire franchise five playable races. Is it overkill though? Space is a big place. Uh, for, for a game, it's a little bit an overkill for the developers. For the fans, it would be amazing. Yeah, that's true. I mean, usually it's it's the balancing that will get you into trouble if you overdo it. Either you end up having very similar factions, or you have factions that are distinguished to one another. But balancing that is the, really the the hard part. I can definitely relate to that. Then also for Saturn, I guess, maybe news? The original Homeworld also used the one network. <laughs> or used one. And yeah, <laughs> that was shut down many, many moons ago. Yeah, yeah, sadly. <laughs> we still feel, feel the fallout from that today. And the last thing is, I think, very rare in gaming that the models basically got the source code of Homeworld. Such a nice change to read that. Really? The actual real entire game stores or just particular parts of it? The internet told me, but maybe the resident expert knows a little bit more. The internet told me, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so what I can tell you that if the source code, code was obtained, then it would have been for Homeworld 1 only. Homeworld Cataclysm source code was lost, supposedly, although some people say that Gearbox just didn't want to remaster Cataclysm. But others say that the source code was lost. And I can say for a fact that we do not have access to the Homeworld 2 source code. But it's also a big achievement if it's for one, so big plus. We'll take what we can get. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, just thinking about fixing stuff yourself. There are many games out there where you would love to have some means of, of, of delving into that and seeing to fixing some well-known problems. They may only on a rare occasion, but they bug you anyway. 
And without any source, it's really hard to do something about that. And having that is, is a real gem, actually. I mean, I think the modern community in Homeworld has already proven itself through the years, but there's always been many cases where even we, too, were like, if only we had access to the source codes, we could fix these horrible roadblocks to providing a better and smoother experience. But it is what it is. Developers are not always keen to share it. Sometimes it's not possible to share it because they lose it. Well, I would say it's time to switch to the pros and cons. Who wants to be first? Who wants to share the secrets of the flavor of Homeward? So we're not talking about a specific game, but the entire franchise or... Whatever you want to share. Because I, I got to say, I, I'm the total noob here. I only have experience basically with Homeworld and uh, the remastered at that. I didn't even look into the old version, but uh, I can definitely talk about that a bit. First of all, you keep in mind, um, this game was on my shame list, you know. Um, I had this on, on Steam for years, I think. Maybe I got this with some Humble Bundle or something, I don't know don't remember but it was there and i never touched that always with this you know at some point at some point i will play this uh, now i got the opportunity to delve into that and that's basically my measure um i looked into it a little bit and played basically the campaign so i definitely don't know all the ins and outs and uh, one or two network games come on top of that but what what i take away from it is actually really okay you can try and create a 3d space game in general and um, controls are always an issue in, in this specific case i, I love having the, the opportunity if someone tells you okay this game is fully 3d not pseudo 3d where units can go up and down a little bit like let's say in star trek armada or something but it's actually fully 3d you say think instinctively Okay, this is awesome. This is cool, and from an optical point of view, and 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 a uh, let's say realistic point of view, it is. But getting the hang of really doing it, really controlling your units and doing things in 3D, it's not not trivial. It's it's really demanding on the player, and I, I love the looks and and the, you know. There are not many games where you can say I take my ships and attack the enemy from above. And I'm not talking about helicopters. <laughs> But really going perpendicular to their usual view plane, so to say, it's really cool. But pulling it off, getting it there and doing it, really doing it is a different matter here. And uh, this can get really in the way uh, of enjoying the situation. The game can basically be also played in 2D, more or less, but it, it, it cuts away the, the, one of those unique points here. Uh, so, so I'm a little bit in, in both camps here. I, I find the idea really cool in essence, but it is really demanding on the player, I think. So it's kind of a pro and a con at that point. I d don't know how they, they d changed it in Homeworld 2 and 3. I have no idea about that. Maybe they improved the controls or something. I don't know. But this is <laughs> one of the main experiences with this game where I think, okay, I r I'm really too dumb or something. I don't know. I don't get it done properly. Yeah. But then again, I just started with this game. Maybe it's just, okay, you have to get used to it. Um, yeah. What really is cool, I think, in the remaster is they added this um, this means of, of having a, a scalable interface. I mean, there are many games out there where you can go into a menu and say, okay, I'm playing this game in 4K. Please, please, please make the controls look a little bit bigger. <laughs> I don't want to have a spyglass or something to see what I'm clicking at. So you have some settings saying, okay, scale it two times or something. But here you can just drag it bigger. This is something that I find really cool because it's directly into the uh, immersion, into the controls, into the situation. If you feel, okay, I need this a bit bigger here, you just pull it and it perfectly fits. So you don't have to go to a menu change the scale, look if it is bearable or not. No, you just do it live and it works. Only thing that I would have loved is if they had put in some more intelligence into that feature, because when I start with a match, it always ends up making the, the interface a little bit too small. 
ending up in a build or research list where I can barely make out the name of whatever it is I'm building or researching. And this was one of the first things that, that was driving me nuts. This, okay, I build something. Okay, uh, what am I building currently? What is going on in, in, in my build pipeline? Until I figured out, okay, I just have to pull this menu a little bit bigger. And then I can see whatever I want to see. And I would love to see this sticking, you know, being set for the next match or for the next mission so that you don't have to readjust this every time. This is the one thing that I think they could have done better with that. But yeah. aside from that, um, I don't know many games that, that give you the means to alter your interface in such a fashion. We have persistent fleets, but not persistent settings. Yeah, Scaling exactly, data. exactly. And th th that's actually a, a good start. Um, this is one thing that, that really screwed me up as a beginner, because again, one of those things where you think, actually it's cool, like having your fleet right from the very start and whatever you do will affect the next mission. Also something that doesn't happen too often in RTS, usually you are faced with a mission, you get a set of units and a task and you have to make do with what you got. And usually this means, okay, you get what you need. You know, there are many RTS out there where the missions are basically get to learn your different unit types. So you have a mission where you get, let's say, tanks, and you basically have to use tanks for all the mission because this is what it's all about, learning how the tanks work. And in this uh, game here, everything you do may have repercussions for the next mission because whatever you end up in the end of the mission, what you're left with, is what you start with in the next mission. And again, um, I'm mixed here because the idea is cool. I like it, that it has repercussions. If you, if you fuck a mission up really totally, let's say you end up with harvesting all the resources, almost everything of it, and you are barely having any ships left because you somehow messed it up. Well, guess what? Next mission, you are stuck with your remaining missions and almost no resources from the last mission. So you really have to to keep uh, in mind what, what, what you're doing there. The and Prince of Karak kind of addressed that, that if you didn't have a certain quota, then the next mission you would get a basic or standard fleet. It's yeah. more of a recent quality of life thing. Yeah, and uh, this is basically what really drove me nuts in one of those missions, I believe Ten House Gate or something. This is the mission where I think you, you start out with whatever you got from the last mission, and you are faced with a friendly that you're supposed to rescue from the attackers. And that's all fun in games, unless you have no units left from the last mission. And what particularly is problematic about this is that this is not really put well in, in, in the remaster. As far as I know, the original um, had you harvest all the resources of the map. And so you had some time to rebuild your fleet and do whatever you had to do to prepare for the next mission. But in, in, in the remaster, you are really tempted to just press this hyperspace button. So the resources are basically harvested all of the map, but you don't have any chance to do some building to construct new units. So you can do it either the classic way, like it's done in the not remastered version, the original version. Or you might end up in a situation like me, where you get thrown into this mission with barely any units and you have to react now. You don't even have any time to rebuild your forces. You have to do it now. And if you fucked it up last mission, if you didn't produce any use in, uh, units, you didn't rebuild your forces, then you are in an impossible mission. Because there's nothing you can do. Yeah, this is something that went wrong when they ported over uh... Homeworld, the Homeworld Remastered, which has to do with the fact that it's based on Homeworld 2, which is Ancient and Rules. But basically, in the original Homeworlds, if you've played it, then if you mess up a mission and you exit it with few ships left, it's not as punishing. Because for two reasons, in the original Homeworld, there's no dy dynamic difficulty. You will always face the same number of enemies. So, and you didn't automatically get thrown into these events or get hyperspace out of a map. So what would happen if, if you messed up a mission? Well, 
that happens. Um, let's just harvest some resources without triggering the next event, rebuild some ships, organize our fleet. And uh, we know what we have on the map. Say we have one missile destroyer, two multi-beam frigates. We know what's coming and we can adjust to it. But in the remastered, they just uh, immediately throw you into these events. Um, you often don't have the time to harvest and prepare it to start. And yeah. th the better you do, the more you get punished for this, which is a really strange and stupid concept. But there is actually a, a mod, well, I, I call it the mods because that's what it officially is, but it's called the 2.3 players patch. And they actually removed, managed to remove the dynamic difficulty. So if anyone is listening to this and you're wondering or you're having the same issues as our friend here has, then download that patch and you can play Homeworld Remastered the way it is intended to. Yeah, that makes definitely sense. Uh, as I said, the idea is basically actually cool. If you know this is about to happen, this is about how it's going down. And the, the funny part is that this is not really addressed, so to say. If you haven't played a few miss missions one after another, you begin to notice, okay, I always start out with the units I had left last time. But the other side on that is even if you think you are preparing, you already said, okay, if you know what the mission is that is coming, okay, you can prepare. But you could also, if you don't know the mission, end up in a situation where you prepare, kind of, and you end up having the totally wrong units. And this is basically what really drives me nuts, that uh, there is no no safeguard in, 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 in place to, to keep you from, you know, shooting your own leg. This is how I like to put it. In Homeworld, you prepare for a mission. In Homeworld Remastered, you prepare for the entire campaign at once. Exactly. Didn't your mother teach you never lose your stuff? And also maybe on the side, steal everything you can get? Yeah, and then you end up having a shitload of those drones drone carriers and you have a mission where they where they don't cut it okay <laughs> nice so. well then steal only the good stuff yeah i mean as i said if, if you know what's coming probably very cool because you can play this game in this fashion it, you can kind of macro manage your, your fleet knowing okay in the next mission i will need those if you know what's coming awesome but if you don't know it's it's really a bummer at times I mean, it's okay even if you don't know what's coming, as long as the rest of the game supports a, such a scenario. Like, it lets you harvest at the start and build up units, mm -hmm. instead of having yeah. to backtrack three or four missions because you lost all your fighters or capital ships there that you now need. Exactly. But from, from a technical point of view, it seems to work out just fine. I mean, we had older games that are kind of problematic, seems to work just fine. What I find a, a, a strange move is to put Homeworld 1 and 2 network games into the same lobby system. When you don't actually know what, what game you are about to play, uh, because the interface is basically the same, you, you just join a, a match. Okay, you can look it up basically what this match is all about, but it isn't like in, in other games where you know, okay, I started Homeworld 1 and I'm going to end up in a Homeworld 1 match. This is what I actually want to. No, you are also faced with Homeworld 1 and 2. And there I really don't know what the advantage actually is of that, because usually when I um, pick out a game for multiplayer, I pick out that game. And um, I don't know how your veterans go about this, because uh, I find it unnecessary, so to say. I don't see the advantage, but I see the disadvantage. I mean... It's just another case of we take what we get, like Gearbox and Blackbird, they decide as well, uh, maybe from a point of view, like let's just unite, unite past and present by making them both playable. Or maybe it's because also game technical reasons, like Homeworld Remastered was all made on Homeworld's 2 engine. Uh, there was a reviewer on YouTube who also said it correctly, like you can think of it like you can play Homeworld 1 on 2's engine, with 2's rules. So, they're not really separate games. They're most. They're just the same game with two separate campaigns. That's just the way the remaster works. But you're right. That's for a races model. I mean, I can't really discourage it because you know the mods that I'm here to represent has eight. <laughs> so I can't really talk down <laughs> on that model. But for the community itself, there's been lots, and I mean lots of balance patches and fan-made balance patches because, as you said, as you increase the amount of races, 
So this increases the amount of balancing that needs to be done and decreases the chance that you can do the balancing right. Definitely, it's, it's mostly complex because everything you do it doesn't just affect affect a match up with three other races or something. If you have eight, you have seven others that you have to balance that against, and it gets just harder and harder. So the contingency plan is eh, as long as it looks good and people have a good time. But yeah, for serious competitive aspects, um, that might be a problem. But it, it's still a very good premise. As long as people are having fun, it's good. Especially if you consider it's definitely not the worst remake. We not only have very beautiful reimaginations of the original games, but also we have the classic games included. So you can have the original experience. And in addition to that, we also have mod support and LAN support. So it can stand the test of time even longer now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was the first thing that really um, made me a little bit smiling, you know. Okay, this game is kind of new, but it still has LAN. It has LAN. Cool. Awesome. Wild, do you want to share any pros or cons with us? So I think the pros... I have to diverge a bit into the titles first, but the pros is that Homeworld was the first true 3D space RTS at the time. So it had a novelty in spec going for it, and it allowed it to also build up a reputation. And it managed to inspire other games like, hmm, we want to have a bit of Homeworld, we want to be a bit like that. So there's the novelty aspect that was, I think, a pro for the series, the reputation it has. Um, I think another pro of the Homeworld series is Atmosphere. Even if you are not a big RTS fan, I think the game is really able to suck you in because of the way it does voice acting, it does music, it introduces races, uh, world building, atmosphere, persistent fleets, a, a unit you lose is actually lost forever. So I think because of those things coming together in this wonderful blend, it's something that can reel in people who might not otherwise know that they enjoy RTS games or they can get introduced to homos in that regard but at the same time it's also kind of a con if that's the way to put it because homeworld is ultimately a kind of niche it's it's a bit of a small pond um because usually when we talk RTS people you know they have their standards titles and People will think of Homeworld because it is such a big unknown franchise, but in general, Homeworld is not really a title you would associate as with the default RTS titles. So in summary, I think pros and cons. Mm, the pros is that it is able to easily captivate you and suck you into this universe. With persistent fleets and the music and atmosphere, you actually feel like you are part of that fleet, you are there in the mystery of space and you're trying to do your thing. But at the same time, it's going to get hard to get people invested in it because, like your friend here said, for new players, it can be overwhelming. You can be at a lot of what to do. Something that should be really obvious, like I can just hold and enlarge the build menu or the research menu, that's not always said. Um, this is of Carrack, which was made after the remaster, actually kind of took note of this because they really revamped the tutorial aspect of the game, made the objectives easier to see and all that. But I think there was a lot to be gained, even more so, if they had just provided the foundation or the quality of life to also let players figure out the game instead of that being a journey of itself. Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes really the small things. I remember this one mission where you basically are affected by this this takeover field. You know, if you get too close, then those units will join the enemy. And they show you for a short moment that there is a certain range within this will happen. But it's not continuously marked on the map anymore. You see this once and then it's gone. And, okay, where can I move safely now? It's just a tiny little thing, but as I say, quality of, of life, basically. If I know I don't 
or I'm not allowed to move my units any further, uh, I won't do it. But if I have to guess where this magic border is, um, okay, am I supposed to just keep my units standing still? I don't know. I mean, it's a game where you're leading a galactic fleet and doing hyperspace jumps. You would assume that surely they have the technology to project a, uh, a hologram of the field. Yeah. And reduce it as it gets smaller, as Intel says. But yeah, this is just small quality of life things or overlooks. Yeah. Then I will basically conclude the pros and cons by a few things I didn't hear from you both. One thing for me is a big pro is that you can really capture the enemy ships. There are some games which allow that, but it's very rare that you can really say, I take everything I want. And it, it's particularly funny because, as we, we, we already talked about, you may use this in the next mission. And if you look at some, some um, walkthroughs, they specifically point you at these things like, okay, this is the mission where you encounter the first heavy cruiser. Don't fuck it up. Don't screw it up. Take it. Take it. This is really expensive stuff. You will need it eventually. Just steal it. You have the opportunity right now. Don't kill it. Use it. And this really changes how, how you go about a mission because usually you would just, you know, throw everything you got at it and be done with that. But in this case, you actually don't want it to be gone. And also that you have to adapt a little bit your strategies to achieve that goal. Because the bigger the ship, the more salvage, frig uh, salvage corvettes you need. So it's not a simple beam over there and kill the crew. No, you have to, to plan for that. Yeah, you have, you have to get your guys there. You have to have enough of them ending up there and take it home. And yeah, it, it changes how you go about the mission entirely and because it really pays off. It's not like, okay, this mission is a little bit easier, but next time doesn't matter. No, on the long run, it can make your life a lot easier. And yeah, I also have, of course, to mention bot support is a big, big plus it's basically also the, the introduction for me into the modding world. The Star Trek Sacrifice of Angels mod was the first mod I ever downloaded for a game. So modding is following basically Homeworld forever now. And I love it. And yeah, I also played, of course, Homeworld 3. Which I love there is that they more emphasize on co-op. There is a special co-op mod in the multiplayer. And another thing, you finally can decide which rotation your mothership is. You want have it just standing in the sky or lying flat on the ground. You can decide. I love that. Team Banana or Team Toaster. Exactly. <laughs> and on the cons, I also have to say, sadly, Homeworld went more and more the Acadi crowd. Not only the the time to finish the game got shorter and shorter. In Homeworld 3, it's around six hours, which is really, really short for an RTS. But it got also more simpler, especially again, Homeworld 3, the UI is very, very basic. You don't even have an indication for speed or DPS. So yeah, I don't like, like that route of gaming. Give me more complex stuff, not simple stuff, please. I mean, I can always live with, okay, this is the default setting or something, but especially stuff like, okay, DPS or max speed or stuff like that. Usually in most games, this is somehow covered up and you actually want to know this at some point if you get into the game a little bit deeper and try to figure out proper strategies and seeing how well a unit would on paper do against another one. You want those values. So it's always useful to have a means to show this instead of having to dive into some configuration files or looking it up on the internet or something, you just have it in game. Having that is actually a positive addition and they can understand that there are people out there that don't want this right from the start. So just make it with a toggle, you know, turn it on and off. Regardless, you can do it whatever in any way you like. Yeah, it's mixed back for me because in the original homeworld, you had the ability to influence the speed and the DPS by basically allocating power to engines or weapons or 
balancing out everything. And I missed this since Homeworld 1. It was a core feature for me because I'm the old school track nerd who wants to divert emergency power to shields or weapons. I love stuff like that. The way I see it, Homeworld 3, just like the setting, it, adv it advanced in technology, but at the same time it regressed to an almost primal level. No unit veterancy, no power shunting, all the systems that you would expect to be there are just gone. And sadly you can feel that also in the multiplayer. It's more or less dead. I looked yesterday, Friday evening, and there was one player session. That's it. That's really sad. I mean, we can you could just predict this would happen from the moment people played Homo 3 and saw what it was. Yeah, definitely you could predict that because it launched with a very, very poor performance. I have not the, the best PC setup, but still powerful and I had not the highest FPS in my life. Let's say it that way. So basically when you're playing games, you sometimes can't tell the difference if you have PowerPoint open or if you're actually playing it. <laughs> yeah, I, I would prefer something else than a slideshow. Yeah. But yeah, here's the problem with Homo 3, or well, what I think the problem is, because people have written novels about this, but very simply put, it's a game that's tried to reinvent itself for a new audience and generation. They failed to get those new players. And at the same time, because they tried to reinvent themselves for these new players, they lost the existing audience. So who is going to play your game in multiplayer and keep it alive? Yeah, and especially if you pair that with a very hefty price at the beginning. It wasn't the most expensive game in general, especially if you bought the standard edition, but if you bought the more premium one and you had this roadmap in front of you, what the developers want to share with you, yeah, basically I want also that, I, I, I want those features to be there, but I also want the community to support it. Having features and no game or no game community is, yeah, shallow. The way it felt to me, but that might just be personal because modding was such a big success in Homeworld and Remaster and were basically pivotal for keeping the franchise alive. Um, I just hope that they didn't assume, well, uh, it's okay if we launch the game in an incomplete state because we can just count on the modders to finish it. We can just count on the guys and the passion to step in and uh, do what we could not. I hope it's not that at least, but... Yeah, it feels a little bit like it, sadly. The way to put it, for Homeworld 1 and the Remastered, the modern community being there was a very welcome bonus. But when I look and see Homeworld 3, it almost feels like it was designed with the modern community as a kind of expectation around it. And then the last row for me, which is maybe also something nice for Saturn, you can do in Homeworld 1 and 2 Kamikaze. Yeah. So you can se send your ships into the enemy directly. I haven't used it, but I noticed that too. Actually something I wanted to try at some point, but usually my units are just too expensive. But the idea is good, you know. It's, it's not a time ship, okay, but it will work. Kamikaze was actually even bigger part of the immersion part in the original homeworld and not everyone may recognize this but in certain homeworld one classic missions you would get a few interesting scenarios like in mission 5 in the original where you were fighting against the Titan and the asteroid belt after you've eliminated their fleet their carrier would actually start to move and try to kamikaze itself into your mother ships or other ships it would run across like we've lost and we can at least try to take as many high gardens with them as we can and same with the needle ships in our mission seven like if it's all f if all else failed then or the fleets with them with it was destroyed then they would actually try to use the ship's armor against you and you could actually feel the kind of last ditch desperation or anger there from those units and those ships as they tried to move themselves into your fleet just small details, just small things, but I think it's actually a big reason of why Kamikaze might actually be even bigger as a mechanic than you would think it is. Well then, before we continue, I also want to ask you, Whitehead, what is your favorite game of all the 
Homeworld games? Ooh, what a tough question. <laughs> Excluding mods, right? Just the base games. Just the base games, yeah. So that's the hardest question to answer because, as you probably know, Homeworld became less of a game and more of a multimedia franchise these days. They've made a pinball game, they've made a mobile game, they even made a virtual reality game for it, which is actually, in terms of story, really good. I can recommend it for that alone. But favorite Homeworld games? Um, I think the story and atmosphere of the first game um, and the space battles of the second and somewhat cataclysm as the kind of mixture between those two, between the atmosphere of the first game and the space battle intensity of the second. For me, it's very hard to choose between one and two, the original versions, especially they are so mixed up in, in my childhood memories that yeah, I can't really decide. I experienced so many good memories in both and both Games have really strong pros and cons, so really hard to decide which one to choose. Because I do, I guess it's easy. You only play it remastered, so yeah. Yeah, no base for comparison, essentially. <laughs> I mean, a small note I can add to this is that's the original Homeworld. What I liked about it was, and it was also present in Cataclysm, the whole backdrop of space, like. Instead of seeing these icons appear in your census manager whenever ships come even remotely close in view, in Homeworld all you had or Cataclysm was just a single dot that would bleep on a big empty map. Like what could be out there? The whole mystery of space aspect. I think that's not a big favorite of Homeworld, but it's not present in the remaster or after it. Yeah, sadly there is a lot missing. For me also Missing is the whole research interface from Homeworld 1. I love this, where you could basically decide this research model, module is researching something for the fighter and you are researching something for the frigates. It was so, so nice to, to immerse yourself into the universe and this got lost in Homeworld 2 and then in the remastered by just having a list of things you have to research, not that special. I mean, Homeworld's research was, I think, all, pretty much always kind of simple, but they could it's one of those many systems they could have done more with, like maybe your research and your turrets that you could fit into your ships or a new ability like an energy shoot, or maybe you just find an artifact on the map and you have an option to research it after you retrieve it and you unlock something, but they could have done a lot more with it. Definitely, which leads me into the next subject, basically, what could a sequel do better? Yeah, basically improve Homeworld 1. Don't uh, give us a new Homeworld 3 title, basically. Give us a little bit more complex Homeworld 1. Again, my toilet factor, please. I need a manual, a big one. Longer story, around 20 hours would be nice. And I also would love, finally, two factions. It, it's okay that you can decide basically in Homeworld 1 if you want to play as the uh, Titan or the Kusharn, but, but it's. I, I want two fleshed out factions which have a real story. I would love that. Especially if you uh, play stuff like Common and Conk, where you have, where you have two long campaigns with, with F FMVs and all the back lore. It's just a dream especially in a cypher setting for me. We can always hope. Maybe someone will listen to the podcast and take note of it. But yeah, it's the mistake this game and a lot of games made. Like, Homeworld had nothing to prove. The formula was already good, but for some reason they wanted to reinvent it. I guess to attract a new, younger audience. But, I mean, I'm not a business executive, but Personally, I think you would have made a lot more money and success if you just made a game tailored to the existing fan base because they started when they were young, they are older now, they have jobs, they have money, and they still remember their childhood fondly. Instead of trying to appeal to uh, new players, short attention spans, lots of title hopping. But that's just me. And Saturn, what would you prefer for a new game? What would help you basically? have a better immersion and a better gameplay experience. 
better controls, basically. I still remember this this uh, mission where you basically have to follow certain parts around the map because there's a supernova thingy going on and it will burn your ships. And just managing keeping them in those dust strands uh, was really a challenge for me because it was really a problem for me as a beginner to see whether the, the target I sent my units at is actually inside one of those strands or somewhere else. I didn't know. And it was not really, for me, it was not really possible to figure that out reliably. Eventually you will get them there, okay, but you know how it is. If I want to succeed in this mission, I don't want to guess whether I'm doing the right thing here. And this is basically what, what messed me up most of the time. Not knowing whether I get my units where I want to get them in, in time and properly. But for the most part, I think it's it's actually already just fine, I think. Especially the, 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 the let's say, technical improvements of the remaster. Like in, okay, I can play this in 4K and it works just fine. It's also not something that comes with every game. Yeah. So f from that point of view, it's mostly okay, I think. And prepare the player a little bit more to what this actually means, giving them some possibility, let's say, build up your fleet in the end or something of that kind. Um, just don't put the player in a situation that is not doable for them. Those are basically the two things that, that make me as a, a success-driven person a little bit uh, itchy, you know? Just having to fight your way against the game. Um, this is always not very good. And would you basically prefer to have it more complex in the sense of, hey, you can fly through asteroids to derelict ships with your fighters, stuff like that? I think that's just fine. I, I, it's, it's not overly complicated, in my opinion. If you, for example, what was already suggested, give your ship uh, more means to, to customize them, for example. Sounds nice on paper. But it also increases complexity, especially when it comes to multiplayer. You could also put yourself in a situation where you customize your unit in a specific way and you end up basically having lost the match already because the other guy came up with an approach that, well, stomps you to the ground. This would be the kind of, of overcomplexity, I think, that I wouldn't want to have in the game added, at least not in, in, in terms of, of multiplayer. In a single player, you can maybe emphasize a little bit more on that saying okay how do you want to approach a mission or something but i think for the for the most part it's it's not too complicated the way it is done the most complicated part about it really is the 3d aspect and aside from that it's just the usual rock paper scissor stuff you have to wrap your hand, head around those in most games usually so it's not really new not too complicated i think yeah, I also think it it doesn't have to be as complicated as in Homeworld 3, where the camera then messes up your game experience. Yeah, yeah. Well then, yeah, I think it's time to talk a little bit about mods. Like I said, it, the games basically introduced me to modding in general, and I played many different Star Trek, Stargate, Battlestar Galactica mods. It's such a rich... Uh, offer from the modding community to the players it's unbelievable what you guys managed what i'm really curious about is how easy is it to mod in homeworld Ooh. well i think this is also a case of the community basically sets that bar for homeworld at least for the remaster because gearbox and blackbird did provide some tools but they weren't all that and we also had a big number of issues with the 2.0 path, but there, because there are so many modders in the game and also very talented people, we, a lot of us were able to get together and write these resources and exchange these resources. So you could look to another or in discords or websites and ask, uh, hey, uh, can I do this or how would I do that? And people would know. And in turn, they would also provide their own insights. So. I think for the remaster at least, I think it's tricky to get into because it can be complex, like tweaking ship values or 
making certain units capturable or even adding a basic new race, that's all fine. But it's about when well, you want to go beyond that, you want to do new things, you want to make them work. Like, I mean, I can't speak for the other mods, but in our case for FX, we had to actually write a script library ourselves and ship it with the mods to make everything work because there was just so much stuff. But that's for Homeworld Remaster. With Homeworld 3, it's actually a lot more straightforward. Like, they actually provided good modding tools and a good website, Mod.io. And for that reason, even we at FX, like when we when we ported to mass the mod over from Classic to Remaster, it took us maybe, I think, about a year before we had the playable version. Now, Homeworld 3 came out last month, I believe. And we are, in fact, already getting close to releasing a first build of the FX mod on it. You already mentioned the name of the project you're working. Can you give me a short summary? What is this FX Galaxy? So, the way I like to describe it is basically that it's a content expansion mod for players who have played the game and want, it, want more of it. Because... Um, with a lot of mods in Homeworld, they were total overhauls. Like, people could play Homeworld and they would be like, okay, nice game, but I'm here for the uh, Star Wars mods or uh, gameplay. I'm here for Battlestar Galactica. But we like to keep it to purely Homeworld. So it's a content expansion mod. Um, the idea is basically to unite all the good things from the games in one project. So we have the eight factions playable and we have with increased units and new game modes, single player missions, you name it. So it's basically turning the fan favorites into playable factions and adding the content where one may utilize those new complete factions. And on the feature side, what did you bring to the homeworld community? I mean, there's some articles on the Mod B page, but from the top of my head, we have a we made a music player that you can change your in-game background music, uh, a custom achievement system because the Steam achievements were just clear mission 10, 11, 12, good job. Uh, we made our own achievement system for that. Um, we have two new challenge modes. Basically, there's a a kind of like a tower-like challenge where you have presets. Uh, races and preset resource values that can vary per player and you basically have to win against the opponent in like a two versus three formats with different difficulty AIs which you can also un interact with as if there were human players because we made a new diplomacy system to interact with AI players um, there's the wave defense mode new single player missions uh, there's new units, abilities, and effects. It's basically, if it's possible to be done in Homeworld, then we kind of did it and went beyond. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but we also made an RPG mode where you basically can live travel between maps in real time. And so something you could do on one map, like you find some cargo and you actually go back to another map and time will proceed. And so it's not like you restart the map when you go to it, but it actually continues where you left off. So like a living dynamic universe. I think that's the biggest achievement. Yeah, and it's a cool one. I mean, there are a lot of games out there that do this kind of to show off. If you look at, at Half-Life, for example, the entire game is, is made in this fashion that you can at some point or you will at some point go back to other parts of the map that you already progress through or if you look at how's it called project eden where you see parts of the map that you already visited at some point you see them from the other side or something uh, it's always cool exactly it's the kind of vibe we were going for but yeah that's just some of the uh, achievements or things we're proud of or features as you call them and was this always the goal to be that feature rich or how did this whole thing start what was the inspiration and the the starting time of the project. So basically, when we started this, um, Homeworld 2 Classic was the latest game there was, and we only had two races in that mod. But a lot of us enjoyed Homeworld 1, so we kind of figured, well, uh, why don't we just add the Homeworld 1 races to Homeworld 2 and make them all playable? So that was the premise. 
Apart from that, the concept evolved. Like a few units from the Tyrannic Raid, the Kadeshi, we became races. And we were like, okay, and what can we expand these races with? And we found concept art from the original artist that was abandoned. And we were like, okay, what if we make those uh, units? Like the Tyrannic Raid carrier, the, the other version. But um, basically, with modding, it's like this you do something. And at the same time, you already feel tempted to keep going and get another idea, like, hmm, but what if we also add this? And what if we also add this, like a music play to go with it? And, hmm, hey, achievements could be nice, and wait, well, actually, uh, what if we turn this into an RPG instead of an RTL? So, modding is a journey in itself. You start with a premise. And of course, you have a goal you stick to as to what you want to achieve, but it's also dynamic. You gain new insights and things you want to do, new goals as you go along. So, it's something that evolves, much like the universe itself. And when did the team first meet? So, the project itself started in 2006, and that was on a kind of like a subreddit, but then for Chinese people, because there was actually a big audience for this game in China too. And those people, those fans, they came together in that sub and they started gathering and we were like, okay, you want to try modding? And uh, yeah, sure. And before you knew it, there was a community forming that was modding. And then more people jumped on with time as the release got out there. And uh, other players that started the mod then left. Uh, new players, new fans from Homewoods picked up on their passion and were like, okay, well, well, can we also contribute to the mod? And they took over. So it's a project that, that's not really bound to people as much as it is to passion for Homeworld itself. But it's, it's the origins, it started in China around 2006. We also found ModDB on this website and we saw that there was actually a big overseas audience for the mods too and the guys basically uh, they started to translate the mods into english with their best efforts and uh, over time it became more of a official project because when the new generations of Chinese fans and players joined the community and projects. Now those people were more familiar with English. They were students. They were having a lot of exposure to the English language. And so you know, people like Homeworld Lover and Lone Wolf and Unlimited X, and they got in on the project. And I've been playing FX personally from the start. Then I was able to interact with these guys, and I got involved with the project and with modding. I was able to do things for the mod. And that's basically how it's all started and came together. It was a small private project at this Chinese forum. And because it was so successful, it grew bigger. It attracted new players, new generation, and well, it just snowballed from there, I guess. I wonder, was there ever a big international forum where the modders met? Or was there always only mod database? Especially in the beginning, I can't imagine. I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, imagine it like that. Um, if I wanted to get into modding this game, how would I get into that? How would I get to learn the ins and outs? How would I get into contact with someone who knows how to do this? In, in other older games, there were some forums or something where you could you know, interact with other people, asking them, how do you do this? Look at their work this kind of thing i mean when you only see the product the release product it's uh, of course nice to dissect that but the social aspect of that would also be interesting so we are currently as you know living in the age of discord as redundant as it may sound but i started to get into modding for homeworld remastered it was mainly a case of well you're in the homeworld discord and you would have a modding section there and you would see people and meet people you might get invites to a specific modern Discord, uh, a global modern Discord where all the project leaders were. Uh, that's two places you could use to interact and exchange tips. Um, most of the mods were also open source or easily decryptable, so you could look at how they did things, what scripts they used, uh, how they made a, a cannon shoot 
they made a unit capturable, so he had a lot of references in that sense too. But Homeworld 3 Remastered modding is kind of complex and niche, but with Homeworld 3, which is Unity, we all started on equal grounds, and as I said, we have a good support platform for that mod IO. And you can find all the mods there, there's also tutorials on how to basically work with Unity and how to mod Homeworld. So the support is definitely there this time. And that's why I think as for new players or those interested, you might be able to jump on and do a lot of things in quite a short period of time. The only limitations are passion and the amount of time you have to invest into it. Of course, w one problem is always the time and the passion you bring to a project, but I can also imagine it's very difficult if there is a language barrier between the different developers. Did you experience any problems during the development of FX Galaxy? Well, it was mainly not a problem among the developers themselves, but in the community. Because, as I said, we had a Chinese community that was doing the modification work. And there was an even bigger English-speaking global community that wanted to enjoy it. But, as I said, the mod basically got so big on its own. Even less, even with the translations not being all there, that it also attracted a new generation of Chinese people who were also fluent in English, and the other way too. It attracted people from the global and English community that were able to better uh, communicate with the developers. But yeah, for the Chinese models themselves, there also were some issues like you have different people in the projects who made their own contributions to the project. And they also had some requirements like, okay, I allow you to continue my work, but I don't want to see my stuff in any other mod. Or you have to reach out to someone who is on a different social media platform at the time, because these days it's more streamlined. Like, if you talk about English communities, then you know Discord, Reddit, all the stuff, but back then, and especially in their community in China, it was fractured. So even if the developers themselves were able to communicate with each other in the same language easily, it was not always easy to find each individual developer that was ever involved in the project and discuss things with them. But then again, since then, basically this new generation got on and they used the same platform, same age range, same proficiency with English language so it had a rough start but it's it's pretty right now and for new models too I think like if you go to the Humble Tree website or anywhere else you will just see the official uh, discord link posted everywhere or if you go to mods.io you will see the guides for modding home mods 3 basically everywhere so communication was an issue but these days i don't think it's much of a problem anymore to be honest that's good to hear homeworld 3 is very new and i guess there isn't much documentation behind it already but is there much documentation about the older titles is it easy for a new person to get into it mm, well i think my answer for this is still the same as it was a little bit ago most people for home i would just start if you want to mod start with homo 3 we all basically had a fresh start those who know unity have an edge of course but the documentation is there the support the modern tools are there compared to modding on homo 3 masters which is already 10 years old by now that's true it they are older games but for me it's always important that documentation is archived that you have the stuff still out there and i wondered is it still out there it is still out there there are websites and there are discords and the knowledge is there it's documented but it's a bit fragmented it's not like there's a website called homeworldmodding.com and you can just go there and click everything um the information is there and but it is fractured that's what i would say so uh, for that reason and homeworld remastered being pretty i think difficult to properly mod on top it's not something i can really recommend anymore at this juncture so the future for you guys i hear is homeworld 3 do you still 
developed for Homeworld Remastered or is everything done for you and you moved on? So for us, the decision basically depends on a few factors. Is Homeworld remodelable and to what extent? Like, is it like Deserts of Karak where you can just tweak some, some ship values and maybe add some new maps and that's it? Now, for Homeworld 3, it looks as way at first. Like, um, they said the only official tool they would release would be a map editor, but at the same time, that we encourage everyone to dip digger, uh, deeper if they want to. But yeah, for Homeworld 3, it depends on the modability and the tools. And now that we've experimented with them a bit, it's actually pretty okay and we see enough perspective. So, yes, uh, we actually released a update about this some days ago on our channels, but we will be continuing the projects on Homeworld 3. Um, that also means that Homeworld Remastered is done as a project. We have a build out 1.39, um, and it will be the final build. Uh, I think we left it in a good place. It's a very big content update. It's patched all of the remaining big bugs. There's a balance overhaul with it. So we left it in a good place, and we're now looking to the future, to Homeworld 3. Since you opened the door now to the Next question, what would you say are you most proud of if you look back to the entire mod project? So this really depends on who you ask, but because the other guys couldn't make it here, I'll just have to also answer on their behalf, that's okay. Definitely, please go ahead. Okay, so um, this is for Homeworld Lover and I, th I just call him personally de facto leader of the project because he has uploaded the mod to his workshop and he's always the guy I go to for the final touches and final details. But basically for him that's the RPG mode and the uh, 33 stage tower-like challenge we designed for the uh, mod where you like, have that match but a very unique twist to it like preset races and research amounts per player in unique formats. So that's in the RPG modes. Uh, if you YouTube it, Home World FX RPG mode, you can get some videos of what it looks like. And that's basically uh, the biggest achievement for him. For the other person, we call him Lone Wolf translated. It was bringing the original mod from Home World Classic to remastered to begin with because uh, we had to port the mod from first a one game to another and then we had to basically touch it up and patch for everything with the 2.0 patch for the remaster so we had to do the fx mod twice basically redo it and to think that we still were able to get out that many releases with that much content is an achievement in itself is the way i would put it and for me, well, for me, it's very simple. I mostly did stuff like uh, the campaigns. I did some work for the shimmering part. I did the, the bonus stages and the finale. I designed some maps, uh, that kind of stuff. So for me, it's the mini campaigns, the single player missions that we made for the mod on all remastered. Uh, I think the Titan one, especially the fifth one, was a colossal piece to work on. It took me four to five months to complete it with the scripts and all the things you want everything, everything to do and I don't really want to think back on it too much but that's the gist of it uh, the RPG mode and the challenge modes the mode itself which had to be redone twice and then the uh, single player missions that's is what we are the most proud of I would say definitely a big list of accomplishments you did and you can be definitely proud of it it's really amazing project i love it so can't wait to see more of it well uh hopefully soon as i said we are modding in homeworld 3 and uh, there's already a sneak peek video up but yeah there's already some things coming uh, it will just start the same way the remaster did it's just the basic what already exists ported over, so you can probably expect the um, races, the single player mission, uh, the challenge mode. But the furthest we got with the RPG mode in the remaster was basically just a open alpha build, basic concept. I mean, we are mostly interested in being able to see if we could maybe turn the RPG mode into its own thing with the new possibilities like 
really really go big on it this time because on homeworld 2 remasters we already pretty much hit the limits of the engine we had a memory limit that we kind of reached around two gigs is it we had to insert all the scripts a script library but basically we were already kept out and there was also the issue with out of sync that kind of impeded the multiplayer experience. It's an issue that's carried over from the original Homeworld. And because the engine for the remaster is the same as Homeworld 2 engine just touched up, that issue also carried over. So you couldn't really do multiplayer on it if you added more races. You would get out of syncs and that would just be that. So I think for Homeworld 3, if we can bring the races over and restore the multiplayer aspect, and maybe uh, bring the RPG mode truly to life this time and then I think we have some interesting things coming but it's not like our mod or I think any mod by itself can really salvage the game uh, from where it stands now as harsh as that may sound I think only Gearbox and Blackbird themselves can salvage the game if they want to I think it's possible but as for what we hope to do, uh, we just hope to provide, hopefully, an enjoyable experience for those who own the game. And, yeah, to get a bit more out of it than the campaign. Yeah, like I said, can't wait to play more of your community stuff, because I feel there isn't much else from the original developers, which I will, wait, will be waiting for, basically. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm burned out of them a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's unlikely. I mean, the, I see two issues with Homeworld 3. One is the gameplay aspect, and the other is the story and atmosphere. The gameplay aspect, I think that can be salvaged. It will take a few months, probably, with patches, because there's, also, there's issues on the one hand, like unit padding. There's issues with the maps feeling, feeling very small. I like to say that they try to put a very big universe into a very small box. So I think the gameplay aspects and the related issues can be fixed with patches. And if you then discount Hongo Tree, people will give it another try or come back. But I mean, this is kind of the big issue. But the game itself, from a story perspective, and replayability offset story. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think it's really possible. I think the best you can hope for is that the Gearbox and Blackbirds, without enough patches, are willing to commit for the months that they need to do this. And then, if the modern community also steps up, the game can probably sort of salvage at least. But. I don't think the game itself as a whole can truly be saved in the sense of a very positive ratings unless they redo it. The content is because the audio and the graphics are there. It's just the content. I totally expect that we will see many bug fixes, but I don't expect that they really give us much more depth in gameplay. I think it will be that shallow always. So yeah. I mean, they can make more open space maps and make Macalids mm, part of the environment rather than the environment itself. And that's something. But yeah, stuff like um, new special exciting gameplay mechanics, like being able to uh, not just plant the turret on an asteroid, but say you take a resource and you mine or hollow out an asteroid. You want to use it as a supply base or send it into other fleet or the units. That's an idea, but. Or that, or a complete story rewrite. I don't see that happening. That and also basic stuff like veterancy, changing, for example, speed or uh, DPS, J just a little bit more. But I don't think they will give us that. They will fix a few problems. They will give us certain kind of new maps, not bigger maps, but different maps. And yeah, that's it, sadly. I mean, just because it's the final game from a timeline perspective doesn't have to mean that it should be the final game of the franchise. There's still untapped stuff like, left, like they could do a prequel game about um, the ancient Hygarian Empire. 
and what got them exiled in the first place directions it, it could be a nice touch you could have a, a game like that where you know after you played homeworld 1 2 homeworld 3 you saw the good guys side of the kushan but then you see that they're basically uh, a former brutal fallen empire and you could explore a game with that premise you could also use that game to tie up some loose laurens like for example link the ships of the ancients I get on wars to the ships in the Gallows graveyard. There's all sorts of stuff you can do. It's a really big universe. And even though in Homeworld 3, the universe kind of seems to be done. It seems to be a universe that's complete, like all the smaller races are gone or assimilated into the Argadans or the antagonist. There's no more mysteries left. I mean, we saw it with Homeworld Mobile. What if a hyperspace gate leads to another galaxy? And what if the answers to the progenitors and everything else are there? Uh, there's a lot of stuff that can still be done. So I hope that they also see that there's still perspective for the franchise. But at the same time, I also hope that they see that they shouldn't need to reinvent the formula. Just add to what already exists. Like with Homeworld 3, I feel like it's reinventing the wheel, but also trying too hard to force new things in and that made them lose sight of the very few things that made homeworld homeworld yeah absolutely true and i also hope there will be new homeworld games there is an unbelievable amount of options which they could explore so yeah i hope there will be a future but like i said i'm not so sure about homeworld 3 the modding community of course they could turn the table. We have seen it so many times in the past that the passionate fans can turn around the game so many times and increase the sales by so much it's unbelievable. So I at least hope there is that possibility. I mean, exactly like what they did with Homework 3 is they basically tried to ensure it's the survival of the franchise by luring in a new audience. And at the same time, they did it in such a way that it alienated most of the existing player base. But, you know, if you just make a game that is everything that Homeworld 1 is, and the stuff from the other games that people love, veterancy, uh, big empty space, exploration, then the modern community will jump onto it. And the passion will again seep through the whole franchise, and other players, even new players, will be attracted to it, space fanatics. So... You don't really need to appeal to a certain audience to ensure the survival of the game. There's multiple ways to do it. And I think Homeworld just being Homeworld and attracting that passion from the modders and in turn bringing in new people is also just perfectly capable of ensuring a future for it. That's basically a perfect end for this video. But of course I want to ask Saturn if you want to add something here. Uh, what, what I would love is a continuous um, scroll, but uh, as far as I know, this has been done in Homeworld 3. It is. You know, the zoom out. That's the one thing that I forgot. He, he basically means uh, that he didn't enjoy in Homeworld Remastered, that you couldn't zoom out into the sensor manager. You had to press space to access it. I'm mean, kind of spoiled. I know strategic zoom from other games that it's continuous. You know, you can look at a small pebble and zoom out uh, to the universe. Uh, do this just by scrolling. And uh, that's basically uh, it. This is just something that I forgot because I really don't understand why they had to make the player jump over those, those sticks. But of course, I also want to open now the mic to our guest. Is there anything on your heart, anything we missed, anything you would like to add, basically? Um, not much per se. I mean, the best I can give is are some final recommendations for mods and a few shout outs to the people involved in them. If people still want more homeworld action, but that's about it. I've said what should be said about the games and from here on it's just personal recommendations. Yeah, please do so. Um. Homeworld and Remastered and Homeworld 3, you have a campaign, but mods can add and often will add a lot to it. Now, if you're talking strictly Homeworld mods, there's a few projects and the people behind them that's really not only kept the franchise alive with their modifications, but they also kept the community alive by sharing their knowledge and 
is being who they are. So this project and the people involved in them, like the Titan Republic mods, um, the Rearm mods, Homeworld ads, uh, Complex is a very popular name, although it has some controversy surrounding it. But um, yeah, if you played Homeworld 3 and you were like, hmm, I feel like I kind of missed something and the modern community for Homeworld 3 is still being set up, then I would say uh, check out the many mods for Homeworld Remastered. There's like 10 or more years development into most of them and they're pretty polished projects. And uh, you can find them on ModDB and the Steam Workshop. And of course, I will include everything in the description. But for now, I would say that's it for this review. Leave us a comment, tell us what you think about the game, and of course, play the game. Until next time. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.